good evening to one and all i welcome you all for webinar on heritage management of historic cities case study of amdavad and jaipur i'll start with a quote by steve berry a concerted effort to preserve our heritage is a vital link to our cultural educational aesthetic inspirational and economic legacies all of the things that quite literally makes us who we are heritage management is the practice of preserving protecting and promoting heritage in its various forms the broadening of properties under heritage umbrella umbrella has dramatically increased the number of places and landscapes that require preservation stewardship and promotion when the entire world is fighting against the global issue of the covid-19 pandemic our action to do deal with our heritage too needs reconsideration in the wake of growing coronavirus outbreak it is significant to know and understand how to incorporate post pandemic planning for urban heritage school of architecture and design manipal university jaipur has proposed a webinar on heritage management of historic cities in india a case study of jaipur and amdavad to deliberate upon the post pandemic ways and solutions to manage our urban heritage the coronavirus crisis has dramatically reshaped cities around the world not to exclude the heritage precincts and settlements within the ar larger urban limits india is one such nation that has already been facing challenges with urban heritage management our speakers shall uh, share their experiences and throw light on the way forward for dealing with current and future situations through case examples of the world heritage cities of amdavad and jaipur it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers dr shikha jain uh, dr shikha jain's wide experience in cultural heritage ranges from representations at international world heritage unesco meetings to conservation planning implementation of more than 50 conservation world heritage and museum projects across india and overseas largely realized through her organization drona as an international expert she has advised the national heritage board singapore prem malaysia sgts uae unesco jakarta office indonesia unesco new delhi office and the department of archaeology myanmar she represented india as a cultural heritage expert in unesco world heritage committee from 2011 to 2015 and guided all nomination dossiers for india during this period she received harko heritage awards for two jaipur urban conservation projects jaipur bazaars and ghat ki goni in 2013 that are also documented as best practice projects by the ministry of urban development the jaipur heritage management plan was also published as best practice for heritage conservation by niua in 2015 her organization drona was instrumental in the inscription of all cultural world heritage sites in rajasthan jantar mantar in 2010 six hill forts of rajasthan including amer in 2013 Jaipur as UNESCO city of crafts and folk arts in 2015 and Jaipur as a world heritage city in 2019 welcome dr shika now i'll introduce architect ashish tambadia architect ashish tambadia started his career from iit roorkee in 2002 as project associate and from 2005 to 2006 he worked with intact new delhi for various conservation projects through his private practice he has worked on varied range of conservation projects including fortification of walls fortification walls of 10th and 18th century phases at hinglesgarh a wmf funded project with government of mp fortification of amdavad city gates of rajkot reports on junagarh lakhpat and dew forts condition appraisal for rani ki wow patan lonar group of monuments luikan plaza iima iima and city level projects like heritage tourism plan for sitpur heritage walk route upgradation amdamad 
As a conservation architect, he has completed projects with IIM Ahmedabad, ASI, Tourism Corporation of Gujarat Limited, Municipal Corporations of Ahmedabad and Rajkot, Government of Andhra Pradesh, Self-Employed Women Association and others. Architect Ashish is affiliated with institutions like ICOMOS, COA, INTAC, GICEA, Uganda Satsang Society of India. He is, an advisory, he is an advisory panel member to Vernacular Heritage Publication, Atulya Varso. He coordinates the National Scientific Committee of Fortifications, NSC Fort at India, ICOMAS, and have initiated multilingual grocery of fortification heritage from various regions of India. Currently, he is heading Ahmedabad World Heritage Cities Trust, which works mainly for urban conservation in historic wall city, its buildings, sites, and living heritage. The trust has started several initiatives of community involvement and capacity building, including UNESCO WH volunteers. We have also present with us our Dean, uh, Faculty of Design, Professor Dr. Anuradha. I welcome you, uh, architect Ashish and Dr. Anuradha. Now I request architect Ashish Timbadia to start his presentation on Ahmedabad city. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Madhura. Uh, I would like to straight ahead uh, come to the presentation. And uh, before that, let me just discuss the way we see heritage uh, when there are monuments or sites which are well protected and it's it has its own boundaries so the heritage which has which has got its own context very well defined as one single heritage site has a very different kind of context and situations of crisis in such situations like pandemic most of the monuments per se the protected monuments are right now not accessible to public but beyond that there is there is not much crisis here we are comparing the two living cities and uh, which has got a very very different kind of perspective of heritage which has got life in it which has got day-to-day -day activities happening uh, so i would like to start with uh, the introduction of ahmedabad of course ahmedabad uh, since last 600 years known as ahmedabad founded by the ahmed shah uh, it has been a city of heritage and sustainable growth and uh, the present day, of course, the old city, the historic city of Ahmedabad, which is now prescribed as the World Heritage Site, uh, the boundaries of the old city itself are considered as World Heritage Site and which uh, confines to uh, the walled part of the town. These are some of the uh, images from the local daily newspapers in how the city is reacting. And uh, most of the places that you see are like shut down but very dense and affected uh, severely also in terms of pandemic the city has its own nature in which it responds in history this has happened in uh, uh, in the spanish flu when the city also responded and that time this core city was the city more or less there were only few mills and smaller settlements outside but right now the context is very different in this Next slide, I would like to go back to history. What were these urban centers and how did Ahmedabad start? Ahmedabad has its some uh, predecessors, like the, the first image that you see on the top, on the right hand is Vadnagar, which has got, yesterday itself there was a new discovery, this, which has got Buddhist uh, relics and Buddhist archaeological findings from the city. It's a living city again. Second one is Patan, where the World Heritage Site of Rani Kivav is uh, there, was the capital of the state of Gujarat, or at that time, uh, the uh, the Malwa region. Uh, but this side, the Gujarat side of Malwa region. So this Gurjardesh capital was Patan city, and next was the city of Ahmedabad. City of Ahmedabad was basically uh, a shift from Patan to Ahmedabad. So Ahmed Shah was initially ruling from uh, Patan, and then he decided that he wanted to establish a new capital city, which would be better located further down south so that it can be connected further to the uh, coastal trade routes and the business routes which were coming from the south of India and going towards the north to Delhi. 
because of course his connections with the Delhi Sultanate would uh, be one of the significant place where he would make sure that this new capital city which which would enable him to rule over this entire kingdom of Gujarat better. You can see the urban scape and the natural topography all the three cities respond to. Ahmedabad has got a river as its direct edge. Uh, other two cities were more or less on the catchments locally and the river was flowing a little uh, uh, far from the city itself. Now when we started inscribing the city or when we say the 600 years old, the Ahmedabad already had two previous settlements recorded in archaeological findings and, uh, and history text. One was uh, Ashawal, the image on your right, bottom right, and the second one is Karnavati. Ashawal was a small traditional settlement and said so there are certain interesting findings. There are, in people's mind, in the memories of people, the Ashawal city still lives today. Karnavati was one of the kings ruling from part and King Karnadev who established a fortress here. So this, this was a fortified town. Uh, so Ahmed Shah then decided to build a larger uh, megapolis city between these two ancient uh, settlements which were there or pre-existed before the walled city was established. Now, why I'm explaining this is uh, Ahmedabad's 15th century development actually was a world class. There were smaller settlements and there is history dating back to as early as 5th, 6th century. But this is the most important part in the in the heritage of Ahmedabad. So this was right on the bank and the, the fortification was built in three phases. The first one was a small fort, forti, fortified uh, quarter called Bhadra. The name Bhadra itself was uh, adopted from the Bhadra citadel of Patan, which was the Hindu uh, citadel or uh, the palace of uh, the king of Patan. But when Ahmed Shah uh, decided to shift the capital, he was quite conscious in making choices. He wanted this idea of uh, Patan to shift to Ahmedabad instead of just making a new city so that all the communities, all the people, businessmen, everybody who is coming along to this new city feels at home. So that idea of adaptation came from Patan. And uh, then the outer fortification, as we see today, the bow-shaped arch uh, form, formation of the fortification was his grandson's, majorly the, his grandson's work, which was Mahmud III. But if you look at the topographical uh, image that we have on the right-hand side, it's basically uh, on the terrain and slowly, gently sloping towards the river. So there is a nice topography. Hello, Hello Nagar based on which the idea of city was founded. So 1411 is, uh, is recorded to be the foundation of Ahmedabad. And this idea in 1411, in the early 15th century, this was one of the largest urban scape with Islamic and Hindu uh, architecture together. So that was the highlight. And that's for, that forms the very important part of the World Heritage nomination dossier as well. Even today, if we look at the, the, the outstanding values of heritage, comparing to rest of the world, the 15th century's development is one of the prime most. But there are, there are more which were later added and which, uh, which includes Mughals. So Mughals, uh, uh, Akbar ruled from Ahmedabad as a subedar, then Shah Jahan and even Aurangzeb. All these three big uh, Mughal emperors had uh, spent their good time. Even Jahangir uh, spent some time at Ahmedabad. So, Mughal rule, have, it has its own imprint on the city. Marathas were ruling for quite a, a time, and then the British rule. And we have included everything. Uh, as I said, this was one nomination in, uh, which was accepted by UNESCO in 2017, which has got multiple layers of history and in living nature. So the last part of uh, the nomination includes the, the settlement pattern, the lifestyle of the city itself, which has got the built heritage of uh, timber architecture, the wooden havelis and buildings, and also the lifestyle in the city, which makes the city a very unique case uh, comparing to the previous world heritage sites of uh, India. Of course, now we have Jaipur as well. 
but uh, that time this was so this is the present status of uh, Ahmedabad as you can see uh, the central area which, which is the world city area which is now uh, defined as the uh, world heritage city about 5.4 square kilometer which was a fortified town and it started expanding the 2000 image uh, 2008 image gives us 466 square kilometer and the new master plan envisages is to go beyond 550 square kilometers so another 100 square kilometers is expected to be the urban areas of Ahmedabad in the new master plan in terms of uh, current population the world city houses little less than 5 lakhs or maybe uh, touching 5 lakhs if we consider the next uh, uh, census and uh, so as i said earlier the world the world city was the city of Ahmedabad and now this old city is one part of the city and which makes uh, which makes the management of uh, heritage as well as the urban management a bit more complicated coming back to the main values which are to be conserved one is uh, the art and architecture so uh, the unesco asks you to define your outstanding values and the architecture which was developed by the early islamic rulers who came here brought not only the city from patan to ahmedabad but also brought along with them the masons the materials the technology of construction so most of the images that you see here are hindu muslim architecture or indo islamic as the british scholars would have defined that so this is the blend of two cultures which was very very uh, vibrant and uh, to adapt to this blend even the rulers of Ahmedabad, uh, starting from Ahmed Shah himself, they were very open to let the craftsman choose his own freedom and creativity and made amendments to the stricter norms of uh, Islamic architecture. So this is an Islamic city having its own uh, version, comparing those to the global uh, Islamic architecture of that time. And this was a, a landmark achievement. This is what was learned by Akbar when he was here as a subedar and then practiced in the uh, architecture of Fatehpur Sikri and uh, in Delhi and Agra so on. So this is one of the learning exercises which probably I assume that uh, have inspired a lot in following centuries of the Indian architecture and especially the Mughal Indian architecture. So this was one of the important aspect the second important aspect is the settlement pattern the city which was founded in 15th century the earlier images that i have shown the fortified city it still holds that that kind of city footprints and the life within it of course up updated and with multiple layers on the city it changes but these are the settlement patterns which have sustained for six centuries and all the the uh, traditional knowledge or uh, the memories of the city which are in place even today so these are the two values value uh, of the architecture of the uniqueness of the uh, master architecture that was developed in the 15th century and 16th century and the second part is the continuity of this traditional city or traditional settlement pattern so this is what we have in, in terms of heritage. So, of course, one can imagine that there is a range. And uh, instead of uh, just looking at the UNESCO defined uh, values, I would actually rather start by saying that it started with the initiatives of the dialogues of people of Ahmedabad itself. Ahmedabad is not really so much a tourism city per se. So heritage tourism is a is very small uh, uh, segment which is playing a role in the growth of Ahmedabad. But way back in 1996, we started the idea of walks and talks. So uh, the, uh, to, to celebrate the provincial architecture that we had in the city, but also to understand uh, the idea of our own heritage. And this walks provided to be very interesting tool of this. So the first one that you see is the heritage walk of Ahmedabad, which is practiced 365 days every day. The second one is about the businesses and the evening walk, so where you can enjoy the city and its lifestyle. And the third one is about the Kranti Yatra. So what was the contribution of the world city in, uh, in the fight of uh, freedom fight uh, from uh, 19th and 20th century? 
so these were uh, the initial ideas of heritage you know this in the minds of people this is the, i'm not talking about the protected monuments here so this was the idea and in 1996 we started talking about this but before that i would like to mention that in 1833 the town fortification walls were de- decaying because there were so many warfares marathas britishers before marathas also moguls and marathas had a war here so fortification walls were were decaying and the city came together the people from the city came together they said we will collect tax on our own businesses and we will restore these walls so the idea of restoration we have a record in 1833 that the first committee was set up and slowly this committee started looking after the city's life and was formed into the municipality here the role of local government or local body of municipal corporation becomes very important so and its roots are uh, based in heritage itself the first formal identification to the city level heritage this is not about monuments again i'm saying is 1961 we have when we have a census uh, with so many numbers of wooden heritage buildings which has got wood craftsmanship listed in the Go- government of india census so that was the first recognition that we have and then in, in 1988 uh, 89 88 89 we have the ford foundation study on the cultural heritage of uh, amdavad which basically talks about the built heritage uh, both monuments and the local uh, vernacular buildings in 1996 as i said with the idea of walks and talks so deliberations used to happen between people and uh, authority the heritage walks and heritage cell started heritage st- cell used to do a uh, lot of awareness building and uh, uh, pe- public uh, gathering on these issues so after that the french government came in and it started escalating up as a very important aspect of the urban uh, development of amdabad in 2002 we have we had the new government uh, guidelines or the uh, development control regulations which identified walled city as a special zone which will have a different kind of construction systems and construction regulations than the other rest of the part in 2007 we introduced a very dedicated specific building bylaws which made sure that the heritage of amdabad or the walled city does not get lost these were the times when the urban transformation were it's ever at, at, at its peak and most of uh, the urban cores of the many cities in india started getting degraded here we had these regulations coming in uh, we have a tentative list and i will give you an outline and in 2017 we were declared the world heritage uh, site by unesco so as i mentioned the two criteria criteria 2 which is uh, to exhibit an important interchange of human values so the hindu islamic architecture that amdavad has developed in 15th century is where the unesco had uh, uh, accepted the criteria for amdabad as a qualifying world heritage site and the criteria number 5 which is the outstanding example of a traditional settlement so these are the two criteria uh, we also applied with criteria 6 however uh, criteria 6 is not inscribed uh, during the committee of uh, world heritage uh, by unesco so in inscribed property as i said is about 5 square kilometer and it's buffer which has got the interface with the city but the city uh, the core city itself is an entity so we have here a lot of uh, buildings and sites which are closely built but the next one is more important where we have so many monuments which are archaeologically protected monuments so as you can see today the inscribed property has as good as 28 monuments almost covering 70% of the built fabric under the national monument uh, authority act regulations so this gives us a little uh, more freedom of management of uh, built heritage in the world city we had the amdavad uh, municipal corporations heritage department active since 1996 as i mentioned in 2017 we started as, uh, thinking of another body which will look after the qualitative aspect of it so there are administrative aspect from uh, heritage department and there are other aspects like the capacity building the community engagement and also the recommendations which were received from the global community of unesco uh, that's how the world heritage city trust was formed and i i started working with the trust earlier i had worked for a couple of restoration projects but the way we see the urban management today it has got a very a very different uh, approach the municipal corporation of amdabad and these are some of the monuments 
we have about as i mentioned 28 nationally protected monuments we have one state protected monument and there are more than 2400 plus uh, uh, locally listed heritage buildings for which we have a specific regulation published in 2007 so this was the management aspect of it and uh, we also are looking at uh, the buildings which are outside the wall city which are more than 300 right now and uh, which are tentatively listed so this is these are uh, the heritage in terms of numbers the built heritage the the tangible ones looking at the city's footprint because this is the most important aspect in pandemic situations the 1800 map the canvas map clearly identifies the city's footprint which was more or less uh, the same but as you can see on the image on the right which was the uh, first surveyed map during the British uh, India period, the early 20th century map. And if you compare that with the city today, more or less the city's footprints are the same. In terms of uh, buildings, in terms of lanes and by lanes, except for there are two uh, main roads which were introduced, uh, the city remains as such. It, it also gets the connectivity of uh, the bus rapid transportation system. There is, a, there is a peripheral road going outside. So there are transportation connectivities which are, which are introduced, but the city's footprints were unaltered. And the next one is the map of uh, the densely dotted heritage structures in the walled city, which are the tangible heritage, which is listed. But as I said, when we inscribe the the uh, wall city as the property it's not only about the listed buildings it is also about the city itself and its foot footprint which has a very very important role to play uh, in uh, communal well-being and the quality of life aspect of the city so this is the idea of uh, one sector or a quarter called pole this is a very famous term now most of you must be knowing about the poles of uh, Ahmedabad uh, every pole has got one entrance gate there would be a common facility like a bird feeder, a, a well, an open well. It would be a temple or a mosque, depending on the community, or it can be a church as well. But uh, there would be a community structure. There would be a community gathering space. But most importantly, the pole gates are, are the only connection between the main roads and the insides of the residential society. So these are the ideas of gated communities which were there. As you can see in this image, most of these are on the image on the right hand side top are the uh, pole gates. So these are all gated community and inside each gated community there would be about 50 to uh, as large as 200 houses in the pole. And uh, the pole, the front side of the lanes would be like this with uh, uh, the bottom image on the left hand side with a lot of timber architecture in the front. And there would be a back lane, which is more like a service lane, about two, two feet or three feet wide, called Chini, which also gives uh, a space for services and laying all, all, the, all the kind of uh, infrastructure that is required. Most of the pole owners, uh, the locals, would uh, take the initiatives. These are not uh, sultanate or uh, provincial architecture, but these are bird feeders, the community wells. These are all donated and built for their own community, for their own neighborhood, by the people themselves. Look at the idea of self-sustainable neighborhoods where they have their own buildings, but they also build their own common infrastructure by themselves. And they have a gated uh, entrance, which has got a, a top uh, chamber for safety and security, which gives you the access, but also restricts the access for the unknowns in terms of uh, attacks in the past, these were very important structures. Even the pandemic, this could be a very important feature. These are the fortification walls. And after restoration, um, there are certain uh, com uh, comparison between the previous and the present uh, condition of the fortification walls, which uh, were not really as gigantic and large, like a very huge fortification, uh, maybe many of the places in, in hillsides. These were, the fort, uh, these were the forts on the plains. So very small, but uh, very important part of the city forming its its outline. And the Bad Corporation also supports the heritage of private heritage. So there are restoration which are happening on the public heritage buildings, which are done and funded by the local body itself. There would be archaeological monuments, which will be re restored by the archaeological uh, departments, whether it's a central government or a state government. And there'll be private buildings, which are 
to be restored by the owner but what heritage department and the Ahmedabad corporation does is provide certain kind of assistance to this this is very important uh, since 2017 regulation of course i mean these are all been updated and uh, amended time to time but uh, this was the time when we actually rethought so 2002 gdcr and 2007 amendment with uh, the gazetted uh, notification for listed heritage structures which are locally listed which does not have a state protection which does not have a central protection but corporations own uh, listed heritage buildings it encourages the retention even for the buildings which are not listed if you look at the present building regulation guidelines it very clearly states that to reconstruct anything on any plot it's very very difficult because there are stringent regulations so you'll have to leave a lot of uh, setbacks and you'll be only getting certain uh, limited fsi but if you have a building footprint which you are going to retain repair restore as per the norms you are entitled to use utilize as much as you uh, presently these regulations actually compared what is there if somebody wants to pull down a building which is a three story structure and builds a new construction the the regulation actually permits him to only go for two story building this is i'm talking figuratively so the building re regulation itself discourages new construction and encourages retention and uh, uh, and maintenance so if you maintain well you are entitled to utilize as much as you have but if you don't and demolish and reconstruct you are not so this is one very very important step which was taken and uh, the recent uh, building the, uh, the central or uh, common development control regulation by this gujarat state also identifies amdavad walled city as a special case and which defines this it also defines and it also recommends the features like the central courtyard uh, the the features like balconies the uh, the projected balconies chajjas which were there in the facades of the wooden structures so there are features which are given acknowledgement and are encouraged if it's a listed heritage building there is also an incentive so to restore and maintain those buildings and not get rid of them which are the traditional heritage buildings we also give financial uh, incentive from the transferable development rights and this is one of the samples of the transferable development rights given for the heritage categories for a number of buildings this is just a screenshot uh while talking about the quality of life in the walled city uh, as i mentioned all the poles are self sustaining units which has got its own safety features but it, but it also has a lot of uh, interesting ways in which the community responds to its its basic day to day life and which is very much inbuilt as a part of uh, the heritage uh, of amdabad so these are some of the uh, uh, drawings of uh, world city buildings which has got a central courtyard which has got pro uh, projected front elevation reducing the heat from the front side because amdavad is in in one of the uh, hot regions and there are certain initiatives to make this kind of buildings and architecture sustained by listing and grading by supporting the heritage registration project a conservation plan right now we are working on an uh, important uh, heritage conservation plan for the walled city along with the niua the national institute of urban affairs to look at a development plan for the walled city itself so we are also going to talk about its infrastructure its transportation and uh, the building uh, uh, footprints that we were talking initially so the first part of the homework that we have done and now we have been working since last one and a half year and i'm sure after this pandemic situation we'll also add some more uh, dimensions to this heritage conservation plan that we are working with the niua uh, we also did later on we also did uh, an intangible uh, heritage diagnostic st study which included and which were very interesting discoveries like the silk weaving crafts which was initiated in ashawali the ashawal the first town of the city there are uh, very interesting kite ma maker communities living inside the wall city which have now may not be geolocated inside the city but it uh, it is one of the very important crafts for a, a large section of communities here wood carving traditional construction and restoration which are some of the um, traditional sectors the intangible heritage sectors that we have started diagnosis right now and the tourism and outreach which is which is as i said is a very small segment right now 
but we which uh, we envisage to be one of the the future so that's it as uh, uh, from the case of Ahmedabad any queries I'll be happy to address uh, the email address is mentioned here thank you so much Hi, um, thank you for that, Ashish Chantatia. That was a fantastic presentation. I'll uh, make an attempt to quickly summarize it. Uh, I think it was really good to hear about uh, from it's a very comprehensive overview of, um, especially for the uninitiated into the um, history of heritage management in Ahmedabad. How you talked about how the city was, you know, how was, how the city was set up, and um, especially, you know, how you drew attention to the. Um, 15th century development, which became, you know, the foundation upon which, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the urban heritage of Ahmedabad was, was established. You also talked about the intercultural aspect of of the city, which was uh, considered to be an important part of uh, its heritage value, especially in terms of arts and aesthetics. Um, I, I think you also touched upon settlement patterns that uh, that have been persistent and continuing. And we talked about two main values. I think you talked about the value of, uni of uniqueness and the continuity of traditions, which you pointed as sort of the main values um, that have been uh, important in gaining and the bath, its world heritage status. Um, you also talked about the importance of heritage tourism, uh, which is important, especially uh, by getting people on ground and getting them to understand and value, um, uh, you know, what you're conserving. Um, I think yeah, the coverage of the, hiti, the, of the history of city's governance structure, which is absolutely essential to the to successful uh, execution of the different initiatives. I think that was um, that was actually really significant and spot on. Um, you also talked about the management, the, the extent to which, you know, I mean, how many, you know, talked about the amount, the, the number of monuments and buildings of significance that are there in the cities, um, and also the guidelines, you touched upon the guidelines. So I think it was, it was a really useful, um, you know, a case study to kind of look at, uh, especially, I, th I think you start to appreciate the different stakeholders and how, how important it is to be in sync in, in terms of, uh, you know, these different um, uh, governance structures um, to, to really get things done, I think. So, um, Ashish, I thank you very much for that. Thank it you. It was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Shikha for her presentation. And we will take question answer sessions at the, after uh, Dr. Shikha's presentation. Dr. Shikha, please. Well, thank you, Dr. Madhura, for the introduction. I will start uh, my presentation on Jaipur, which is really about you know the journey of Jaipur, I mean, towards heritage conservation and going to world heritage, and of course now. I mean, whether it is world heritage or not, heritage for Jaipur is an essential aspect, you know, that needs to be dealt with. Um, going back to, you know, how it looks in the 18th century, designed by one visionary person, Sir Y.J. Singh, you can uh, look at how the ar this archival image shows, you know, what Jaipur looked like. Um, it was probably, it's, it's the only 18th century city in India which is designed with this kind of planning, with this wide streets that still continue to accommodate uh, the traffic of today, 21st century as a living heritage city. So you can see the contrast. And, uh, you know, when it comes to smart city, I just feel that, you know, how, uh, you know, how can you can get smarter than Savai Jai Singh himself who designed this 200 years back. And it's really good. That's why that Jaipur has taken this heritage area for smart uh, city development because it's really caring for its heritage. But this trend of, uh, you know, uh, caring for the heritage really started long time back. I will quickly introduce you first to the planning of uh, Jaipur. It was, you know, even when Savai Jai Singh was deciding on his new capital, they were moving, you know, from the earlier capital of Amer because it was getting congested. It was a hilly uh, uh, capital which would not allow further expansion. And it was at the time of 18th century when Jai Singh, Savai Jai Singh had very cordial relations with the Mughals. They were serving as commanders to the Mughals and fighting for them. So uh, he envisioned this city, which is more of a trade and commerce city, you know, completely on the plain. So you can see, you know, Amir was right up on the hill. But this was a spot he decided where you see the water body in the center. 
the lake talkatora was there and one of the first buildings to be built here was you know the temple of govind dev ji and uh, the astronomical site of uh, of uh, jantar mantar observatory and these sort of determined the center of jaipur these were of course aligned with if you see how they are aligned with the hills in the surrounding so the center of the city actually aligns with ganeshkar uh um, you know the top of the hill at the back whereas the axis the main axis which actually uh, you know um, defines the badi chopper or the main square was aligned with jaigarh the previous um, you know uh, fort next to amer it was used for defense of amer and later also for jaipur and shankargar in front here the moti dungri area and the east west axis was aligned at a specific inclination the same as the sun dial of uh, jantar mantar and that's how you can see the grid developing the badi chopper and then at equal distance you have the choti chopper coming and finally the you know prastara plan uh which is uh, so much talked about for jaipur so i would not get into the details of the prastara plan there are already enough authors and scholarship on this um uh, what is interesting is that for authors and researchers have further found out how jaipur worked for its defense so you can see what you see in these circles are basically the you know throw of the cannon from jaigarh jaigarh has the second uh, largest cannon in asia and it has a throw of up to 80 kilometers and this you can see how the defense of amer and these wall uh, you know uh, wall walled um, areas of jaipur the uh, city wall itself was designed to take care of this defense so basically the hills that you see in the background the fortifications that existed earlier and the new city wall together worked on the defense of jaipur though it really did not need much of defense because at the time it was emphasized it was purely a trade and commerce city but of course what is most unique and interesting about jaipur is the city plan proportions which are derived again from the jantar mantar uh, astronomical instruments the sun dial the angle of the sun dial you know 33 degree is what aligns with the rest of the road network so the city uh, plan proportions are derived from astronomical instruments and also um, you know uh, the width of the streets is related to that extra savai you know extra quarter and their specific proportions so it's a very well designed well planned city jaising studied a number of uh, you know historic city plans across the world his library was full of these plans which were brought in from america from other places in the world and and even the vastu shastra itself he studied in detail to really come at this uh, particular plan along with his uh, advisor and architect uh, vidyadhar and this is an 18th century plan of jaipur which is from the kapardwara collection so it shows how jaipur was finally planned of course there are i am not getting into more historical plans but there are several construction drawings kind of plan which sort of show how jaipur was being built how these chokris were first constructed the one from the west side and it was really it's one of the cities which was built on a project mode you know this is also recognized by unesco in its world heritage inscription that it was one city planned and finished in you know a limited time with a very uh, project oriented mode so it's it's a very good example of a design city of 18th century in terms of planning and projects i will start from 2006 onward which has been my association with jaipur itself when it was also you know heritage management plan for the city was made it was the first city in india to actually prepare a city level heritage management plan and that was in 2006 7 when 1096 listed uh, structures were um you know inventory here uh, it also shows like in on the left side you can see in terms of planning from 2006 to 2020 what has uh, been happening there have been architectural control guidelines initiated in 2009 10 the heritage management plan was finally included in jaipur master plan in 2025 uh, in 2013 and it, that's the jaipur master plan of 
2020 till 2025 and uh, then of course in the smart city plan wall city heritage management what is important to note is that heritage has been a very important segment for jaipur and uh, it's 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 there everywhere in the planning whether it's at master plan level or the smart city plan or any other activity simultaneously they have been very active in taking up conservation projects and that again the the process started in 2006 7 as a major uh, conservation project of amir fort was taken up that really set on the use of traditional techniques traditional materials training of the masons and then you have you know subsequently projects taken up throughout the conservation of jaipur bazaars the ghat ki guni jantar mantar and other areas and including the heritage walk that were taken up and parallel to that you know it has also been moving forward with certain unesco inscriptions you have jantar mantar which was the first world heritage site state protected archaeology site in india to be uh, inscribed in 2010 uh, amer fort which was in the amer town um, it was part of six serial um, hill forts of rajasthan nomination and then of course uh, for jaipur rather than moving forward with the inscription of world heritage site though it was on tentative list um, it was preferred that we first go for the unesco creative city nomination which is actually uh, a network to uh, promote the crafts and art of jaipur so so this was a deliberate decision and further to that it was proposed for inscription um, and in, in 2018 and inscribed in 2019 so i'll just quickly go over the whole sequence uh, in 2006 there was a need uh, felt for a jaipur heritage management plan by jaipur municipal corporation and a special committee was created the jaipur heritage committee which looked into creating this plan and because you know the economy of jaipur relies on heritage tourism as well as culture and creative industries and at least 30% of these creative industries were in the wall city so it was really you know decided that a heritage management plan will be prepared and we were part of you know the team that prepared the whole plan it was linked to the to, to the master plan of jaipur so basically it had to look at the city core or the wall city area but also outside the wall city area whatever uh, other heritage sites like ghat ki guni amer fort or others in the surroundings were there they were also part of the inventory um this shows the listing under heritage management plan and uh, this as i said it was it became part of the jaipur master plan 2025 and it was recognized um, as best practice by niua in 2015 but here you can see you know similar to what uh, ashish was showing for amdabad we had ford listing ford foundation listing that was done in the 1970s which showed around 289 uh, historic structures but when in 2006 7 when we did the listing again we realized that about you know 50 or 60 of those structures had already gone so every time when we go through a new listing one realizes that you know that there are certain uh, certain uh, uh, heritage structures getting lost and in uh, 2006 7 when we completed this we had about 1096 structures now we have identified about 1500 structures which are being uh, inventoried by intac as part of the process um as uh, you know once this heritage management plan was completed there was prioritization and implementation of conservation projects which was i showed you in the second column how these projects were taken up uh, this of course is outside the world heritage property but it acted as a catalyst conservation projects for urban renewal which was later on then uh, taken up for the jaipur uh, wall city so this is a you uh, on the outskirts uh, it has 52 properties in a valley and a very interesting project like i said you know this these are the kind of conservation projects at urban level that act as catalysts uh, to uh, you know promote our traditional craftsmanship traditional materials and techniques for which rajasthan of course now is one of the leading states and these projects in jaipur were, were the first uh, precursors that took for, took that forward this project also had a challenge of relocating uh, a, a major highway because this highway was going up from the top in this two and a half kilometer stretch of ghat ki guni and damaging the 52 heritage structures because you had these trucks you know moving around so this was a major infrastructure project simultaneously realized and implemented in uh, 2010 
where you had the diversion to the highway so that you could actually protect these structures and uh, you know retain this particular hatkiguni street um as part of a tourism heritage tourism development plan and this was completely like i said this was one one of the first facade conservation project that acted as a catalyst which was later on you know taken up in a similar manner for the jaipur bazaars and uh, even uh, heritage walks are now started here since 2014 and the, uh, is now listed walk with sahapidia similarly inside the wall city of jaipur like chokri modi khana heritage walk which is one of the old uh, chokris inside uh, with the traders living in the area it was initiated in 2003 by jaipur virasat foundation and intact to ngos and it became one of the driving uh, forces that led to improvement of the thatero ka rasta later uh, till 2014 15 till this got implemented this was you know taken up in detail mapping the streets in the walk area you can see each street has its own character the building condition assessment of 106 buildings you know what is the state of conservation what date they are from and how to upgrade them and also the social surveys of each property in the walk you know which owner owns how many uh, vehicles how do they get in what is their income and if they want to get uh, involved in the walk this was a participatory walk design so what would they want their house you know to be involved in some of them wanted it to be like a museum visit for people to see you know uh, some of the artifacts that they had some of them wanted to offer refreshments like sharbat and all to get the traditional cuisine into the walk experience so this was walk was designed involving the people in chokri modi khana and also even looking at you know whether there could be a bed and breakfast stay like some people wanted this old room of theirs to be converted like a paying guest accommodation so these kind of proposals were developed and there was even involvement of institutions like in this case oxford book study um, you know the the students of urban planning did this project with us where we gave them the drawings and they actually designed a proposal for the mahavir uh, chowk in um, chokri modi khana and this is not the only institutional uh, you know collaborative exercise that we did for jaipur i mean it's it's also a part of our practice you know to incorporate to involve institutions and students throughout so there are several examples like this i'm especially mentioning this because i think there was a question uh, framed by one of the participants you know how does one foresee the role of institutions so definitely i think for practitioners it is just you know the project remains incomplete unless you have involvement active involvement of institutions because it adds a lot of value especially in terms of urban conservation and participatory approach so these proposals then we finally put you know together for the community so you can see these chokri people actually commenting on this and then there were people from other chokris who came and said oh why can't we do it in our chokri and can you organize something like this but this is something very key to urban conservation because you know the community itself has many voices and to address all these voices especially in case of a city like jaipur with so much population becomes a challenge um uh, jantar mantar in 2010 was taken up as the first world heritage site and its management plan was implemented you know in between 2011 and 2015 uh, we it did not have earlier the interpretation centers these very important documents of savai jaising you know how he studied astronomy these were all lying locked so this building was actually uh, restored and this display was uh, prepared and even in terms of any new things like you have stone signages using the local craftsmanship that is a tradition that continues in jaipur even in new sites and their conservation um a buffer zone uh, proposal was prepared because of course the property of uh, jantar mantar had its own buffer zone and that's the time one also started looking at urban conservation because the buffer zone included the tripolia bazaar and part of the sire diori bazaar so looking at the jaipur bazaars its uh, historic layering was done and you can look at see this historic layering so it was the first layer was 18th century which is the time of uh, savai jay singh too and uh, you know you can see the particular style of rajput uh, mughal architecture you know blended very well and then you have the second phase which is around the mid 19th century um and that's uh, savai ram singh 
and he is the one who you know took uh, had influences uh, from the british period so you can see you know like uh, colonial arches and those kind of sort of indo saracenic features adding in these buildings in green that you see and the last layer of course is the 20th century layer early 20th century by mirza ismail who was uh, the main uh, uh, you know advisor to the rulers of jaipur at that time and you can see the facades the shopping facades of jaipur that came up that is the last layer and also has art deco features uh, like the golcha cinema hall and other buildings so it it was important to understand these historic layers because if you're going to conserve the buildings then you need to know which one belongs to which period and that's the kind of intervention you are supposed to take forward uh, so based on this even for the the people of jaipur to know there was a facade control uh, you know uh, uh, booklet designed based on these historic styles so so they know what style their window is or you know if this is um, uh, the british uh, influence this is the art deco period that you see and that's how they would use the material or the technique or even the style to uh, conserve it properly and these um, urban conservation of bazaars was taken up in 20 between 2011 to 2013 it was also awarded by hatko it was one of the first facade conservation projects where uh, government money was put into conservation of or facade conservation of the Uh, uh private buildings and this served as a very good model because later on when government also floated the hirde scheme for 12 cities the first question was you know when we proposed heritage walks they said why should we spend money on public buildings for sad conservation and then they they looked at the jaipur case and they had supported it during nurm so it was taken as an example and then you know all uh, the facade conservation of various bazaars was approved on that basis so these are examples of the facade conservation three uh, facades uh, three bazaars were uh, conserved in 2013 14 and now further nine bazaars have been conserved in the last uh, three years under the smart city plan so these are views showing you know the condition assessment and the before after of facades and then of course 2015 onwards the uh, main components uh, in this case even the jantar mantar heritage management plan for the buffer zone was uh, funneled into the smart city plan so like the proposal for global art square or even the previous you know dprs or pro, uh, planning uh, aspects were sort of interweave with the smart city plan so that it's not like two different things functioning uh, in the city Uh, at the same time like i said the creative city of crafts and folk art was a very important designation for jaipur uh, because it's not the tangible heritage built heritage there was enough conservation works happening there was enough promotion of the traditional crafts but then you also had jaipur designed as a city of crafts by savai jay singh you know he was a great visionary i mean it's trade commerce but it's also crafts and uh, this is what you know one looked at the the uh, even in the 18th century he really felt that crafts people uh, need to be promoted it was the chhattis karkhanas that were started with the planning of the city and the royal family sustained uh, this patronage uh, for a long time because even um, this these are the chhattis karkhanas mapped so there are some karkhanas like tater khana or modi khana or imarat khana which were like the building uh, or the you know water heating departments within the palaces which are no longer there but then there are other one others like the paintings one with surat khana or uh, you know the one with the goti and zari that still continue as traditional crafts so this is what was mapped even in the creative city and now as criteria 6 for uh, world heritage and this uh, somehow continued which is you know really good for jaipur because in even in the 19th century when i mentioned the british period the indo saracenic buildings which very well like the selbert hall incorporated the traditional uh, craftsmanship but this was also a museum of crafts that they built you know the building itself so the british period also promoted crafts though in a very different manner than what it was earlier and even in the 20th century now we see you know 20 first century like we have uh, the jawar kala kendra but still you have a fusion where the uh, artists and craftsmen get an opportunity 
to work with uh, you know designers institute of crafts and design or nid people and really develop the crafts further and that was the intention of you know uh, unesco creative city of crafts and folk art this is a mapping of the location of the crafts clusters both inside the walled city and outside and the major crafts that are still sustained in the city of jaipur and of course what these crafts are intangible are have to be interlinked with development so that is one of the main criteria integration of crafts with development plans it has to be part of the sdg the sustainable development goals and master plan for jaipur and uh, that's the reason even in case of world heritage designation we were very keen that it goes for criteria 6 uh these are sample formats which were used for mapping the crafts people the craft itself the craftsmen that were mapped and each craft i'm not going to show you all the details but we have these details where like something like meena kari where the craftsmen actually moved from amer and before that they the family had shifted from pakistan area and uh, they, their origin and evolution the material and process which was really time consuming because crafts people are not ready to share this knowledge it is really you know they really train only their family with this so so it took took a lot of time but we have all the crafts that i've shown you all of them documented in this process which was part of creative cities and at the same time building crafts which you know jaipur is so rich in whether it's stone crafts the lime crafts uh the frescoes or the murals and the mirror work so it has you know all these uh you know uh, spread across the city in its various havelis palaces and uh, public buildings and the idea was also to you know gen to have crafts walk linked with built heritage so this is like the chokri modi khana walk that extended um it's one of the walks during um world tourism day on october 2016 where you see them looking at the havelis in this area but also talking to the lakh bangal maker awaz mohammad who's you know one of the master crafts person here and he actually made you know the first letter of uh, um, first alphabet of each uh, participatory uh, per each person participating in the walk um, you know with lakh and uh, gave it to them and this was of course direct earning for him it's like just like 40 50 rupees but there is direct link to the economy and uh, the world tourism day again this ended in jantar mantar which is a world heritage site and here you see you know uh, one of our visually impaired interns who's actually showing the site around to these uh, differently abled uh, students so it's basically big inclusive you know of all people whether it's the crafts people here or whether it is you know uh, the uh, you know regarding to universal access we were trying to address all uh the crafts workshops for a week uh, you know continue on world heritage day and this is jaipur municipal corporation supporting there are institutions like iogen intac and other colleges of architecture other institutions who get involved so like i said that it has to be participatory and linked between ngos as well as the government together because that's the only way to look at urban heritage uh coming to the world heritage nomination itself it was a long process you know it was on the tentative list in 2015 uh but rather than putting uh, the dossier together for world heritage we preferred first to go for the world uh, creative city inscription and then it was submitted you know in 2018 in the nomination dossier and finally got inscribed it's a one and a half year cycle so july 2019 is when it got inscribed as a world heritage city and currently jaipur has to prepare the special area heritage plan as part of its commitment to the world heritage committee which is similar to the development plan that um, ashish mentioned for amdavad but there is a deadline of december 2020 which probably now will get a bit postponed because of the covid situation uh, this is a image of the nominated property so you can see the walled city completely as a nominated property and the buffer zone in blue which shows the buffer zone we wanted to incorporate all that is was essential for the jaipur city planning so the hills that i was showing you earlier which mark the axis of jaipur plan which is the outstanding value had to be incorporated in the buffer zone and that's what you see you know right till moti dungri hill out here um and the hatroi hill and valtaji out here all these are part of uh, buffer zone including amer at the back
Um, in the final report, ICOMOS, you know, considered that criteria two definitely is important for Jaipur, and you can see from the aerial view, it manifests an interchange of ancient Hindu, Mughal, and Western ideas in the urban form and architecture. So that is one criteria that is recognized. They also propose criteria four for Jaipur as an outstanding example of an architectural ensemble with city planning and an urban form reflecting ancient and modern influences to produce a commercial city unparalleled in scale and magnificence in the period. So this is again, this is a, a criteria, you know, two is there for the architectural, um, you know, uh, amalgamation of various architectural styles and iconic monuments, whereas criteria four is largely for the town planning, where the attributes are the, you know, uh, grid iron plan uh, inspired by the prastara, the chalks, the square chalks, choppers, and the city gates, and those are the attributes which define Jaipur. Jantar Mantar, of course, now this is a World Heritage Site within the World Heritage Site of Jaipur City. So, you know, it's doubly inscribed. Hawa Mehel, Palace of Winds and other iconic um, buildings, besides, of course, the bazaars, the living bazaars of the pink city itself, and the city gates, which are intact and well conserved. Um, ICOMOS, like uh, what Ashish had said, also had uh, concerns about accepting criteria six, though it was already there as UNESCO Network of Creative Cities. Yet we felt that it is important to get criteria six, uh, you know, into the World Heritage Planning because then you are sure that it is under protection and there is no, you know, segregation between built as uh, an intangible heritage. So this is something that we had to convince and finally it got accepted. It was quite challenging, but this is one aspect that we were very concerned about that criteria six definitely for Jaipur has to be there because Savai Jai Singh, you know, he's, he was a great planner. He was a visionary and he designed Jaipur in a superb manner, but then his, all, his vision was also to promote the trade and crafts. So that also had to be in. And there were certain concerns of ICOMOS, which was on the condition of the city wall, on the condition of the encroachments in Jaipur. And these are management challenges that we are still working on. Um, so some of the gates are in very good condition, like you can see in this aerial view. Um, but finally, with certain terms and conditions, Jaipur was inscribed, you know, by UNESCO as stated by them as an expression of the astronomical skills, living traditions, unique urban form and exemplary innovative city planning of an 18th century city from India. And uh, this, of course, is the 38th UNESCO World Heritage Site, the last one inscribed in 2019. We were fortunate to have the DG UNESCO herself visit Jaipur in February 2020 to give the certificate. And currently the commitments, you know, that Jaipur is still working on, they have to develop a special area heritage plan. So the work on the plan is initiated. There is uh, involvement of UNESCO, New Delhi, technical experts in this. There is an inventory of heritage buildings that is required, which is commissioned to intact. Uh, a structure, management structure, like what Ashish was showing, we had to also create one for Jaipur World Heritage. And it was, it is at three levels. We have the state level heritage committee with the chief secretary, uh, you know, overseeing the committee where you have everybody like the smart city, um, you know, tourism and all other departments coming in because any project that happens even metro any project that happens in the world city area has to be now monitored as per, per the unesco world heritage committee guidelines at second level we have the technical heritage committee which is chaired by the chief town planner uh, mr vijay Vargia, at the moment and this technical committee really evaluates any projects that are submitted for the Jaipur Walled City. So the technical committee looks at whether there is any heritage impact, whether they should be taken, whether sh there should be any changes. And it sends back to the agency, which could be Smart City or uh, whichever uh, uh, body that is taking up the project. And lastly, at the lowest level, but the most important is the Jaipur Heritage Cell. And it has recently engaged two conservation architects full time, which is assigned to look at you know the daily requirements within the wall city of the locals the approval of the heritage uh, structure plans 
any changes in that and also developing the special architectural control guidelines further uh, one of the other concerns of icomas was also the heritage impact assessment that is essential for uh, the smart city projects to be taken up so those are also commissioned and to different consultants and are in progress and preparing a detailed monitoring plan which is now part of the special area heritage plan of course now with the additional issue of pandemic planning the post pandemic uh, situation it needs to be incorporated in the special area heritage plan 2020 and i end my presentation with this slide where you can see you know the attribute like the city gate which is one of the values you know added as part of the world heritage actually in this case becomes a point of control and an operational element even for post pandemic planning so it's become like a control point so so that's what the site managers really need to look at which are the values you know that can actually be have multiple roles and used in post pandemic planning while also taking care that the heritage is not impacted but when we i'm ending again with the archival picture when we look back at the 18th century and uh, you know i would uh, close with one of the queries that uh, mr vijayvargiya raised um, saying that uh, how do we ensure you know economy continues in jaipur and there is there is less density here and how do we ma manage the post pandemic situation because this is a city with 400000 people now in 2 square kilometer of area which was initially designed only for 50000 people so i would say we you know this archival image is sort of an indication the pandemic is sort of an indication that we now need to get back to looking at you know mobility pedestrianization and more uh, you know earlier traditional ways of living that has that needs to be now incorporated in the post pandemic planning also of course the other point is that we one is using advanced technology like drones which are being used very well for the monitoring of uh, uh, lockdown in case of jaipur there are it is an epicenter and they have about uh, 15 drones and 800 cameras in this 2 uh, square kilometer of area so it's really you know how you use the technology at the same time these drones are also uh, making uh, you know videos for raising awareness of people on how this how beautiful the city looks in lockdown and how we can maintain it in this manner so thank you that is the end of my presentation and uh, let me thank see you, if Dr. i can shikha for back to such share. a wonderful presentation sure yeah uh to sum up uh, i'll just say that uh, you have uh, explained the evolution and growth of jaipur city historic city as first planned city of india of 18th century then how unesco has uh, emphasized on city project oriented mode for jaipur city then you have explained chronologically about jaipur planning projects sorry yeah. then uh, as you rightly said that heritage is very important segment at all levels in jaipur and you explained about the importance of conservation projects then there are lots of sites in uh, uh, by unesco in wall city of jaipur then you also emphasized on uh, creative city in 2015 to promote art and crafts of jaipur city which started in 2006 and then there was a need of jaipur heritage management plan uh, then blend, uh, that with the master plan of jaipur you have also emphasized on best practices by listing under heritage management plan of jaipur like ghat ki guni project then uh, heritage walks are important then how mapping streets then building condition assessment and social surveys and i think through this you have rightly uh, pointed out or uh, explained that how community participation is also important in heritage management plan then as you said rightly uh, institutional collaboration will add a value to heritage heritage management plan yes of course i think all the stakeholders needs to come together that is uh, government ngo then institutions and the community then we can uh, have a better management plan then you also uh, explained about proposals of signages and 
interpretation centers, then historic layers, layering of bazaars, then blending of Rajput and different styles of architecture actually. Then facade control project, first time recognized by the government and how it is uh, taken by the government and provided to be a very good model for others. Then you have expressed that heritage management plan also uh, blended with the smart city plan. It is not in isolation. So this, uh, there is a uh, inclusion of this heritage management plan at all levels. Then again, uh, you said that uh, as Jaipur is a city of craft and folk art. So evolving identity of Jaipur, then fusion of artists and craftsmen, how it is important and how it is addressing the SDG goals also. Then uh, you have, I think, shown us how you have mapped the crafts, then craft works with uh, built heritage. Then you have uh, rightly said that there has to be a universal access for inclusive planning. And process of, uh, then you explain about the process of uh, World Heritage City, what are the criteria, and how Jaipur has been nominated as the World Heritage City and why it is outstanding example uh, because of uh, certain reasons like they, you mentioned four reasons because it is based on the uh, traditional wisdom like ancient plan like Prastara that was one of the reason then yeah, as you rightly said the city planning and urban form of Jaipur is based on Prastara then long-standing arts and crafts tradition that city as a center of uh, artistic excellence as envisaged by our Savai Man Singh, then World Heritage, you uh, explained about World Heritage Committees, how it is functioning, what are the different projects. And I think at the end, you have also explained that how we can take care of uh, values for this post pandemic planning, like mobility and pedestrians. And because the city was uh, designed for, as you said, that uh, for the 50,000 population and now it is much more. So still it is catering to the needs of today. So we have to again go to the traditional techniques like mobility and pedestrian. So thank you for such wonderful presentation. And now I think we will take the question answers and questions from our participants. I request Neha to read the questions, please. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, indeed, both the presentations were so good that uh, it has kept uh, all of us glued by the end. So I think now it's time for questions. I would also like to thank the participants that while registering, they've already posed so, uh, so many interesting questions and it has helped uh, us and our speakers to incorporate uh, most of them into their presentations. Uh, thank you to the speakers for that. Uh, we can still take some questions that the participants had uh, posed. Some of the questions that were not uh, that were not covered during the presentations. So uh, the first question is uh, how one looks at the contemporary architecture and crafts as compared to the rich legacy of both Jaipur and Ahmedabad. Shikhaji, are you? Uh, well, I think I sort of answered it when I was saying how NID and Jawar Kala came, you know, and looking at contemporary. Yeah, it's both an example of contemporary architecture and also cra contemporary craft, but with inclusion of the traditional. So, Jaipur already has some examples. Maybe uh, Ashwiki can respond. True. I think even uh, Ahmedabad, the, the new building regulations, which is like uh, since 2002 onwards, the new regulation looks at the typology of construction in the wall city specifically. Of course, it does not go beyond and uh, prescribe certain characters and elements as there, but has done very interestingly the kind of typological understanding of uh, how what kind of windows, what kind of doors and uh, uh, architectural features. That is left to the freedom of choice to a person. Uh, except for uh, listed heritage buildings and adjoining structures, so the, the vistas in areas which are defined and regulated by the the heritage conservation committee, uh, this is left open, but within the planning constraints which were given. So this has to fit into the Ahmedabad World City module in terms of planning, which is has been identified. But beyond that, I think uh, Ahmedabad is is open to uh, experiments with uh, contemporary architecture as well, even the World City area. 
uh, whenever there is a, a direct impact, the Heritage Foundation Committee may intervene and say there are certain kind of uh, aluminum uh, composite bonds will not be uh, allowed or certain kind of color schemes or materials which will be prescribed or not uh, included. This is the case of Ahmedabad. Okay. Uh, can we take the, the second question now? Yes. Okay. Uh, then the other question is, uh, did the presence of outstanding universal value, the criteria 6 in the UNESCO World Heritage Closure of Jaipur, gave advantage in the protection of intangible heritage in the city as compared to the absence of OUV, the criteria 6 in the case of Ahmedabad? So how is uh, the tangible heritage of historic core of Ahmedabad being protected and managed? So I guess uh, she has very well explained the importance of criteria 6. Uh, it is not that Ahmedabad did not have criteria 6. We already had described in the nomination dossier. And uh, since 2011, when we had first the tentative uh, nomination, we have been ascribing. But there is a different difference in context. Here it is not really about only the uh, craft practices. The criteria 6 in Ahmedabad's case, if you look, it is more about uh, the the businesses and build, uh, business people, communities which uh, took the city to a next level. Just to compare the present situation, I was looking at one of the archives of uh, 1918 Spanish flu. The local Mahajans, which were like tradesmen uh, uh, society, they collected a lot of funds. They actually uh, supported the local, not only the local pandemic situation, but also the villages in surrounding. So there was this local intangible aspect which we had uh, prescribed in the dossier. Then there was the uh, contribution of Ahmedabad for uh, the freedom fight, the national freedom fight. Gandhiji's association here, establishment of Sabarmati Ashram, Sadar Patel's contribution. These are all criteria six uh, aspects for Ahmedabad's case. But unfortunately, what happened is in the uh, in the World Heritage Committee discussion, many other uh, members did not uh, f uh, felt that Ahmedabad may be qualifying for criteria 6. So the dossier identifies, but uh, UNESCO committee did not approve of criteria 6 in case of Ahmedabad. So 2 and 5 were approved, but not number 6. Uh, then we have another question. Uh, in your opinion, what would be the role of architectural education institutions in management of historic cities? Uh, so again, Neha, I think I have already answered this. Is probably, you know, Dr. Madura would take it up. Like I already mentioned the collaborations that are possible and should be done. Yes, so I, I think, yeah. Dr. Shikha has already answered this question in her presentation. And I feel strongly that uh, as an institution, uh, we have human resource with us, then we have research labs with us, then we are in the city itself. So we can spend a lot of time uh, for doing surveys and whatever information and analysis is needed for that. And until and unless we come together as a educational institutions, then uh, uh, NGO, government and community. So there is a need of, uh, uh, it, this is a role of uh, educational institution for heritage management plan. And uh, there are provisions in universities and educational institutions that uh, you can have that uh, memorandum of understanding with NGOs and we can work in an efficient manner. It's very interesting. Even Ahmedabad, I think I can, uh, if I start listing, there are so many institutions working here, but NID, SEPT University, planning institutions like Nirma, uh, Anand, these are all coming in right now. We are in the process of documenting whatever 2000 plus buildings that we have. So a number of institutions are working with us. We are working with NID on visual improvement. You know, the Jaipur had already done very interesting urban uh, uh, facade uh, restoration work. So we are right now working with NID on a very interesting research project on visual language of city. So institution does play a very, very important role. It is not only about administration and people, also about the multidisciplinary approach. And institution are very, very important part. And what I feel, I, I think all, in all the institutions, we have electives, we have dissertation, we have research projects. So we can give this live project to our students. 
and that will be a better uh, output uh, with with the help of NGO and the government. The participant wants to know whether identifying urban issues beyond those that a planning or urban design studio would do in terms of heritage yes, conservation. Yes, yes. I think, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, as, as the introduction itself, these are cities. These are not sites. These are not just one building or one uh, particular place. These are entire cities and there are so many aspects. So uh, health is one important aspect that we, I mean, we are we are in the uh, process of actually relooking in the entire uh, urban management and health. The old cities, the uh, congested areas, which are not designed for, uh, I'm talking about 15th century city in Ahmedabad, which was not designed for any mobility and transportation. The vehicles that we have, the parking requirements that we have. So uh, that's where I think the, uh, the uh, entire urban management will have to look at uh, very differently. So that's why we said we will do a local area plan with conservation in mind. So conservation becomes the center and then a local area plan, which is as local as uh, a pole level, as, as a neighborhood level planning and uh, to address certain kind of issues which can be addressed in terms of quality of life, not only conservation for heritage. Thank you. Uh, then uh, another question we have, uh, for cities like Ahmedabad, where the heritage area is already facing gentrification, and for Jaipur, where the heritage precinct is expected to get gentrification due to migration of the host community due to commercialization and foreign trades. So, uh, these cities either have socio-economic implications or likely to have these impacts. So, how are we going to manage the privately owned historic structures in such heritage cores where the residents are of low income group? And they also cannot afford the high cost of preservation with uh, no, no benefits. And also the residents who are unaware of managing the heritage assets. Uh, so I just want to clarify this, you know, for Jaipur, it is generally the impression that is only, you know, the city is functioning largely because of tourism and the gentrification will happen. But we did a very detailed social survey of the shopkeepers and the residents of Jaipur. And uh, the survey results were really, you know, quite surprising for us because it, they clearly stated that they don't associate with tourism as an economy. Their economy is largely dependent on local wine, you know, like the Sikoria Bazaar utensils are bought by the local people of Jaipur. So Jaipur, in case of Jaipur, I don't see any risk of gentrification. Even if you compare it to other Rajasthan cities, you know, the Jaipur wall city doesn't have heritage hotels inside the wall city area. You don't have that people buying Havilis and converting into hotels and other people moving out. Whoever is also, if, if they are making changes, it's the owners themselves. So in our survey, we found that gentrification is not a risk definitely in case of Jaipur. And I don't see that as a risk. But the issue here, of course, is making the owners more aware of traditional conservation and why it is important for them now being part of World Heritage. So this is something like raising awareness and in fact when it got inscribed I got phone calls from some owners saying you know thank you we got a city inscribed. So that kind of sense of ownership and protection and saying oh this is a value this is world heritage I need to keep it like that. That we need to you know generate among people whether whatever class they are you know. So, so that is what is essential. That's true even for Ahmedabad I mean gentrification uh is not really happening if i would say uh, that there is a change in transformation in community structure that we have i mean traditionally they were, these were all neighborhoods owned and resided by homogeneous communities which is like now mixed up communities which is fine i think that's not gentrification uh, there are a few owners who would actually go for heritage homestays because now the policies support them uh, but that's like very handful in terms of numbers, some age heritage homestays or hotels which are functioning right now in the world city, not really a significant number to, to qualify as gentrification. In the past, if you see the 20 years back, 10 years back, there was de-gentrification happening. So most of the people who are well off transferring out of the world city, which was the trend seen and which is where, uh, you know, the degeneration started and people lost, started losing the interest. Uh, and the building craftsmanship also, which was thriving in the city now, have more, more become like export houses for carved uh, wooden elements, but not really looking at the building crafts. 
So these, these are the kind of things that, that has happened in the past and as I mentioned we did the di diagnosis uh, study for crafts which were there to revive. But I think not really to an issue of rather the gentrification or degentrification and the other stuff. I have one question from Shikha. Shikha, I just want to know what are the issues involved in maintenance of so, heritage buildings during the uh, current pandemic and uh, what actions needs to be taken by the government so as to protect the building during this pandemic which will last for another few months. So I think, uh, you know, in fact, there was an earlier webinar where we were actually addressing World Heritage Site and pandemic, how to monitor. And that's why I showed the example of how your city gate is actually a very important feature, you know. But it is being protected, it is actually being used during the pandemic. So there are certain elements like that which will be used. But then otherwise we need to have a small monitoring team in place, you know, like the heritage cell of the Apple Municipal Corporation should have a small monitoring team for inspecting the heritage area and to ensure that it is being protected. There is a, a text which is prepared by ICROM, the international body, and that is very useful in monitoring whatever is heritage of, is of value, even in the pandemic situation. Uh, then we have one more, uh, Mr. Thank Pankaj Vatva. Maybe uh, we can take just one more question. Thank you and a great presentation. Uh, just wanted uh, to uh, know how are you taking care of fire uh, uh, in these wall city areas and water conservation and uh, uh, what about solid uh, the sewerage management uh, solid waste management what are you doing about it because most of these wall cities are pretty dirty at many corners and all i i hope uh, with the smart city projects and all uh, and the water conservation is a very big issue and safety because fire brigades and all cannot enter these areas so how you are taking care of that so uh, this is you know when we are talking about the development plan when i say special area heritage plan is going to have several secondary plans which would include a disaster risk reduction plan by you know special experts it will include all these services plan which will look at the traditional systems and then what new ones advanced ones to be incorporated so basically all aspects that you are mentioning you know, it could be traffic tourism interpretation services and uh, uh, disaster risk reduction and uh, all such plans would be then together forming the special area plan we've already done that in case of jantar mantar jaipur where you know you can see all those plans in place and for Jaipur, it is in process and it will take a total of one to one and a half years to develop all these plans. But that's definitely, I mean, all these aspects have to be taken care of. Thank well, you. I think uh, similarly in Ahmedabad, uh, we had, uh, of course, we are working on the infrastructure planning as part of this local area plan. But we had fire hydrants and the pipelines which were laid because the larger tanks cannot enter. But what they do is they take the main tanker to the main road. And then there is the underground pipes which are connected to insides of the port. And there you get your local hose. So there was some system which was functioning earlier. Uh, this was, I'm saying, uh, mid 20th century, we had installed this kind of systems for fire uh, safety because wooden architecture is much more uh, yeah, in that sort of And uh, we are all looking at reviving some of them also. But in uh, addition to that, we have got two wheeler fire hydrants, so which, which are specially designed very small size fire hydrants which have got high mist and uh, low, pr uh, low high pressure high mist kind of throws so with, which does not need too much of a volume of water and uh, we are also looking at the other technologies which can support like drone or uh, if you could have seen uh, some of the uh, you know pictures that Ahmedabad was posting uh, through different media so there are very sp case specific tailor made solutions which are to be found in terms of sanitation and water supply, Ahmedabad, the, the world city had a very, very interesting and uh, detailed uh, uh, infrastructure laid out already in early 20th century. So this was around independence time. We already started doing the underground uh, good drainage network and water supply network, which has got its maintenance manuals as well. So that's, I think, some, some somehow covered. But we are looking at the upgrades. 
majorly the challenges uh, in Ahmedabad are more related to transport. Okay, so I think uh, we are running short of time. So for the rest of the participants, uh, I think uh, the uh, presenters have also shared their email IDs with you and uh, you can also mail us at the following uh, email address for any other queries and we can get back to you uh, with the presenters. So uh, now over to you, Dr. Madhura. Yeah, uh, I request Dr. Anuradha to uh, give vote of thanks and some of Dr. Anuradha, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Shikha. Thank you, Ashish, uh, for a fantastic presentation and for taking out your time to be with us. It's not sort of getting to about late evening now. Uh, I'll take up a bit more of your time with the presenter's time and I think those two questions that were asked initially which was that what is the role of institutions in heritage management and Dr. Madhura gave a fantastic answer and so did Dr. Shikhal. I just wanted to add to that is that you know they say it's a, there's a lot of benefit for students as well to start to study historic architecture as architecture rather than historic architecture you know because a lot of times students study historic architecture and say ha, 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 ha. you know it can't happen anymore. You know, so I think it's actually really important that they understand climatology uh, because there's so much that we teach in our curriculum. As an educator, I can I can tell you that there's so much that they learn is theoretical. And and if you happen to be in these living cities like Ahmedabad or Jaipur, you know, um, there's no better place to go and learn this uh, than, you know, the buildings itself, the sites themselves. So whether you're looking at climatology or building materials and construction or site planning or services, you really need to understand the logic and the, the basic concept rather than just replicating what is being done in the 20th century. So there's a lot of value in that. Um, so it's not just a, I, I definitely think institutions too should take a leading role in creating archives and labs, you know, um, for being sort of assisting people and being custodians of heritage. But there's also a lot of value in students looking at and studying architecture as architecture in a historic context rather than as historic buildings, which removes it, you know, which makes this, this whole thing kind of seem very irrelevant to them, that it is no longer relevant. So I think that's something we really need to emphasize as educators. And the second point I want to make about contemporary architecture is, I mean, Ashish, you talked about um, the development controls. I think that's that's good, but it's probably not enough. And I think we would demand contemporary practices, practicing out of historic cities to respond, uh, not in a historicist or a stylistic way, but in a, in a way that represents the spirit of the place. So, so no, no copying, you know, you suddenly don't want to see this kind of copying, you know, copyist, you know, mimicry of historic styles. But I'm just, I'm just remembering the kind of architecture that you see in Venice, for instance, a work of um, um, uh, Carlos Carpa, who is so aware of, of, you know, the fact that Venice is, is a lagoon, it's a watery city, it's, you know, his architecture, the use of materials, the kind of spaces, the space planning is so responsive to that. And so I think in, in today's day and age, we want intelligent and clever responses, definitely going beyond taking taking into account the development control, suggested guidelines, but definitely going beyond and paying an homage and kind of an ode to the historic cities and the historic fabric that is there. So in closing, thank you very much for providing us um, a fantastic space and a fantastic uh, substance to this debate and for, for uh, and I thank you on behalf of Manipal University Jaipur and the Faculty of Design as a dean, of, as a new dean of uh, um, Faculty of Design and for Dr. Madhura for, uh, you know, uh, asking me to give the vote of thanks. So thank you very much and thank you for, uh, and thank you to, to the participants as well for their fantastic, for really br brilliant questions. I think that makes a panel discussion much more interesting. So thank you everyone for your time. And see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm signing off. Okay. Thank you so thank much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.